Okay, another new lesson for AP Calculus. We have already done the test right here of implicit differentiation and related rates. That takes us to day 36 of the year, supposedly. Of course, we work different pace. Using the first and second derivative of a function to ana analytically determine the intervals of increasing and decreasing. Concave up, that's new for you. Extrema, and points of inflection, that part's new to you. The other things you've done before, but are going to use the second derivative, you'll see. If you take a fast look at what's to come, we're going to do a little bit of this. This is all related to the f and f prime and f double prime. It's all related till there's time for a quiz. So we're not going to spend a whole lot. We're not going to be spending that many days in this. We're going to be moving on and finish up this unit. Okay. Let's get started. All right. We're going to analyze graphs and look at them and make some graphical connection as well as our analysis which has to do with the taking derivatives that's the mathematical component and we're going to compare the functions with the first derivative graphs and the second derivative graphs this is only part one there'll be another part after this let's take a look at a cubic function that you have seen before it's already graphed for us. So we're supposed to answer some questions regarding what you're seeing. This is the graph of G, regular plain, plain function. By now you should be able to tell me at what values of X does this graph or does a function, G, have a relative max or min? Well, you should know max and mins are hilltops, and valleys, they're extremas. And they're relative because all extrema are relative, including absolute extrema. In this particular function is cubic, there are no absolute extremas because it keeps going up forever and it keeps going down forever. So no matter where you pick a point, there's always a point lower or higher than it. So for the mountaintops and valleys in this problem. I see one here, and I see one here. So maybe we can agree that it's x equals to 0 and x equals to 2. At least I think it is, based on the picture. What can we say about the derivative at these values? Well, derivatives means the slope of the tangent line. So if I was to have a tangent line at this point... I think it would look like this. I think this one would look like this. So what could you say about those derivatives the, at that point? I hope you would see that the g prime at these x's of 0 and g prime at 2 are both equal to 0 because that at, at x equals to 0 and 2 are horizontal tangents. Now, let's look over to F. We've seen a picture like this before. We've seen this seagull before, the bird that I've talked about in the past. <clears throat> what values of X does it appear to have a relative Max or min? Well, the relative max or mins occur whenever the derivative is zero. Or, in this case, the derivative is not zero because this tangent line can't stay there. It, has, it doesn't know what the slope is on this side or on this side because the slope is... Well, this is a sharp turn or a cusp. 
So that would not be an accurate tangent line. It, it actually doesn't have a tangent line there. So who are we trying to kid? But it does have a minimum. As a matter of fact, that relative minimum, it's the lowest place around the vicinity of this point, is also an absolute. Absolute minimum because nothing's ever going to be below it. So what value of x does f have a relative max or min? I would say that would be x equals to a negative 1. What could be said about the derivative there? Since you cannot draw a tangent line there, we're forced to say f prime at a negative 1 does not exist because we're at a cusp or sharp turn, which we've uh, talked about before. That takes us down to a question about algebraically finding f prime of x. Then perform a sign analysis of, of this. So the function was, let me get a copy of this function. It'll let me. All right, let's do this derivative and let's perform a sign chart at, well, sign chart analysis. And what we do with our sign chart is we find the derivative from left to right. Power of two thirds goes to the front. <clears throat> Keep the x plus one. Take one away from two thirds. Two thirds minus three thirds, negative one third, plus a zero. That looks more like this, two over a three, and that one negative one third forces it to be a cube root in the bottom here, x plus one. A sign chart says I would set this equal to zero and find where the derivative is zero or the derivative does not exist. Now, we all know that where your numerator is equal to zero is where your derivative has horizontal tangents. Where your denominator is set equal to zero, and you solve it, would be where you, this would be horizontal tangents are found there, or ex, ex, relative extremas. They're all relative extremas. Or, so is this a relative extrema? Where it doesn't exist, that would be, uh, does not exist, would be where derivatives are undefined. That can happen also at an extrema. So just for fun, if 2 equals to 0, what, does, what can x be? Well, you should be seeing that there are no x's in the problem, and this is a non-true statement all the time. So therefore, there are no horizontal tangents. Okay? There are no extremas because of the numerator. But I still have a denominator here. So I take the cube root of, well, there's a 3 in front, 3 cube root of x plus 1, set equal to 0, divide both sides by 3, cube root, x plus 1 is 0, cube both sides, boy, I'm really wasting a lot of time because you already know this, that gives me x plus 1 is 0, and that gives me x equals a negative 1, which we've already discussed about x equals to a negative 1. That was where we said was a relative minimum. Well, the sign chart does this, if you remember, x and f prime of x. And the only, only critical number I have that is called a critical number, if you recall, is the negative 1. And we know at this point that the derivative there is undefined because it was in the denominator, if you recall. So I pick an x to the left. I'll pick negative 2. I'll pick a, an x to the right, a 0. And I need to plug the, those numbers into the first derivative. Well, the first derivative I have written right over here. Let me rewrite that. f prime of x 
was a 2 over a 3 times the cube root of x plus 1. So, yeah, it looks okay. So I have to plug in a negative 2. A negative 2 plus 1 is a negative 1. Ne a cube root of a negative 1 is a negative 1. So it looks to me like I get a negative 2 thirds is what the derivative is there. If I plug in the 0 in place of the x, I get 0 plus 1. So 0 plus 1 is 1. Cube root of 1 is still 1. That gives me a positive 2 thirds. Since the derivative is different on both sides, that was the reason that we could tell that it was, from the left, it was decreasing. And then from the right, it was increasing. And it actually looks like it could have been even smooth curve and said, oh, that's a relative minimum. Well, it is a relative minimum. It just so happened we saw we saw the picture of the graph. It was not a smooth curve. It was a sharp turn. You would not have known that by just the sign chart. You would have to have realized that, oh, I was using uh, a function where the derivative was undefined there at negative 1. Moving on. Now, we've been doing a lot of work with polynomials, and polynomials are the easiest ones to find derivatives. It's the easiest to find the critical numbers. It's the easiest to set the derivative equal to 0 and solve it, and so forth. So let's take a second and reflect about uh, what functions can do. Yes, they can have max and mins. They can also have max and mins at cusps, sharp terms. So in other words, here it says places where the graph of the function has a cusp that does not exclude the existence of a relative max or min, as we just saw. Define critical numbers. They are the x values where the f prime of the x is equal to 0 or undefined. Now, if your derivative, f prime, is equal to 0 or is undefined at x is a, then f of x has relative min or max. If your derivative was greater than zero, was greater than zero, well then we know we're talking about uh, if f of x, your, your f prime of x was greater than zero, then we know that f of x was increasing. This is not new to you. If your first derivative was less than 0, we know f of x was, or for that matter, is decreasing. If your derivative changes from positive to negative, let me remind you, the derivative went from positive to negative, then that became a relative max, so negative, I mean, sorry, positive to negative, we're going that way, we have a f of x has a relative max. Or it could be absolute or global, it could be, but doesn't. that's not the issue. If your first derivative changes from negative to positive, it looks like this, negative to positive, See, negative was going down, then it changed to positive. Then we know f of x has a relative min. We use the first derivative often to determine intervals of increasing and decreasing.
We also use that first derivative to find relative max or relative min. We've talked about second derivatives. We've even talked about the graphical uh, description called concavity that we use the second derivative for. We use the second derivative to talk about being concave up or concave down. And we also use the second derivative to identify points of inflection. We've only talked about it and looked at pictures. For instance, right now, I'm looking at this cubic right here. Everybody and their brother could tell me that this function can spill water. Water is pouring out. So what we say about that is that would be a concave down scenario. And then this side is holding water. So it would be described as concave up. And, and I don't want to confuse you. The concave up is this whole region until something else changes. And this concave down is continuing as well. But where in the world did this change take place? Where did concavity change from concave down to concave up? Well, we can identify it as somewhere in there. And in there, somewhere, somewhere in there, is a point of inflection. I call it a poi, a point of inflection. And now we're going to try to find those things, okay? So how do we find it? He thinks that in pre-cal you talked about it, but maybe better teachers than me. I've never really discussed points of inflection uh, in my pre-cal class. We want to perform an analysis to discuss this. So what we do here is I'll get my, my g of x is x cubed minus 3x squared. I will find the second derivative. That's the goal. To talk about points of inflection and concavity, we go from g prime of x first, which is 3x squared minus 6x. Then we take the second derivative, which we really haven't spent a lot of time discussing why we do that. But we do that so I can set this equal to 0 and find critical numbers. Again, critical numbers from the second derivative. That's going to be a really easy one to do. The critical number here would be x equals, if I go plus 6, then divide by 6, I get x equals to 1. Well, look over here. x equals to 1 corresponds to about here. So right here, when x is 1, could be a point of inflection. As a matter of fact, at this point, we say possible point of inflection at x equals to 1. A papoy. It doesn't graduate to be a point of inflection until I do the sign chart for that second derivative. So for that second derivative, I pick my x value, which I got was a 1, and I'm going to compare g double prime of x. And remember, the second derivative at 1 was 0. So what I do, I pick a number from the left, left of 1, 0, right of 1, 10. And see what's happening. And so let's see, I'm going to plug into the second derivative which is right here. So 6 times 0 is 0 minus... That's a negative 6 or negative. I plug in the 10. I get 60 minus 6. 
That's a 54. Well, I'm not going to write it. Positive. Oh, yeah, you could say negative 6, which is negative. You could say uh, 54, which is positive. What does that imply? It implies that everywhere to the left, negative infinity to the critical number 1, g of x was concave down. Because g prime of x was less than zero. From picking back up at one all the way to infinity, g of x is concave up because g of x, g, pri g of x, g prime of x was greater than zero. And more importantly, I know for a fact that at x equals to 1, there is a poi, a point of inflection. And if you truly want the whole ordered pair, we take 1 and we plug it into the original equation way up here. We plug it into the, if x is 1, we get 1 cubed is 1. Minus 3 times 1 squared is minus 3. We get a negative 2. So at 1, negative 2, I have a point of inflection because, we've got to have a reason. That's all about the AP test. Give me the reason. Because g prime of x changed from negative to positive. Or you could say G, I, and that was double prime, sorry. G double prime of X went from less than zero to greater than zero at X equals to one. Let's move on. So the next page says, perform the sign chart for the second derivative of g and discuss it. Well, we already did it. We already did the whole work. Let's fill in the table that we had just discovered and talk about what happens if your second derivative is equal to zero or is undefined at x is a, then there is a, those are, that's a critical number, okay? there is a possible point of inflection at x equals to a. What happens if your second derivative was greater than zero? Then we have f of x is concave up. If your second derivative is less than zero, then f of x is concave down. If two things are happening here, if your second derivative changes from positive to negative or changes from negative to positive, then we have, in fact, not a poi, we have a poi. A point of inflection exists at x equals to a, where it changed places. Now it's time to practice a couple problems. Let's practice what I'm preaching here. For each function, determine the points of inflection and the intervals of, of concavity, where the function goes concave up and concave down, and justify. Justify means write out those, e, those sentences. So if f of x was equal to x to the fourth minus 4x cubed, well, first derivative, 4x cubed minus 12x squared, second derivative, 12x squared, that's kind of funny, same thing as I had here, minus 24x. At this point, we have to find the critical numbers, so we set that equal to zero. We are finding critical numbers. So that means uh, factor out a, 
both have x's, both have at least a 12. So if I factor out a 12x, that leaves an x minus a 2 is 0. That 12x could be 0. x minus 2 could be 0. That means x is 0 and x is 2. So those are my papoys, possible point of inflections. In order to find out what is true or not, we make a sign chart and we plug it into the second derivative. And we know that at 0, it was 0. And at 2, it was 0. So now I have to pick numbers on either side. Let's be, let's be very predictable. Negative 1, 1, and 3. Boy, that's predictable. And I'm plugging it up into the second derivative. I'm going to plug it up into the second rewrite. Factor it, it's easier. Because really, in essence, I only need to know positive or negative. So if I plug in a negative 1 into the 12x, that gives me... Uh, a negative 12. If I plug in a negative 1 into the x minus 2, that gives me a negative 1. And I know the product, I know it's a 12, but all I really care about is that it's positive. Positive. So I plug in the positive 1. So when I plug in the positive 1 in the 12x, I get a 12. When I plug in a positive 1 into 1 minus 2, I get a negative 1. Yes, that's a negative 12. All I care about is that it became negative. If I plug in the 3, I get 12 times 3. I know it's 36. 3 minus 2 is a 1. And I know that's a 36, but more importantly, it's positive. So I have found a, a, pos a point of inflection. First of all, I discuss my concavity. I have two concave ups. So I'm concave up from negative infinity to the zero, unioned with uh, a two to infinity. Concave up because f prime of x was greater than 0. I have one interval right here of concave down. Concave down from 0 to 2 because f prime of x was less than 0. So by looking at the, the sign chart, with if I didn't even know the picture, I know I, I'm opening up, then I'm opening down, then I'm opening up. That would be a good rough sketch of my function. And since I'm an expert at a function that has three turns, one, two, three turns, the original function was a fourth degree because I have a Whataburger picture. La la, it's there. Pretty good graph for a fourth degree. Go ahead, graph it with a calculator. And you should see something with your imagination that could resemble opening up left and to the right and have a couple turns in there. Let's do another one. A little harder because it doesn't always have to be polynomial. It can be exponential, and this one requires a product rule. So this is going to be a little harder. F prime of x, the first, 2x, times the derivative of e to the x. And I am going fast. I'm just by myself with my cats and dogs. They don't seem to ever stop me from, they don't, mean, they don't need me to explain anything. So you have the advantage of rewinding and listening to it again. So the derivative of the second, e to the x, is always e to the x plus the second, which is e to the x, times the derivative of 2x, which is a 2. I'll just put that 2 in front. Now, to do f prime, or to f double prime, it's going to be a mess because 
This is another product rule, so you're going to end up with at least two terms in there. And then you're going to have to do the derivative of this piece here. So you're, you might have a total of three terms. So f double prime will be the first 2x times the derivative of the second, which is the derivative of, of e to the x is simply e to the x, plus the second times the derivative of 2x. Again, that just is another 2. Plus, now you do the derivative of this third piece here. That's just a constant of a 2 in front of e to the x. So the derivative of e to the x is e to the x times 2. So it's just itself, pretty much. I need to set this equal to 0. Each term has at least a 2. Uh, they all do not have an x, but they all have an e to the x. So I'm going to factor out a 2 e to the x. That lead, Now, you, you probably saw ahead, you said, you could have probably combined these two, but I'm playing ignorant. I didn't see that. So I'm factoring out 2 e to the x, and I end up having an x plus a 1 plus a 1, which isn't wrong. It just means that 2 e to the x could be 0, or x plus 2 could be 0. And if 2 e to the x was 0, what could x be? Let's see, the graph of an exponential that is not shifted up or down or shifted left or right looks like an exponential, goes up forever, crosses at the x is 0. And that's an ordered pair 0, 1. It goes forever to the left, never touching the x-axis, goes forever to the right. Did you hear my keywords? It goes left forever and ever and never crosses the x-axis. It goes to the right forever and ever, never crosses the x-axis. If it can't cross the x-axis, this cannot happen. Can never happen. That is not a true equation. It's never true. And this other side, x could be a negative 2. So that's the only critical number I have. So I got to make my sign chart. F of x. No, it's not sorry. Got crazy here. I do x and I do f double prime of x. And there's a 2 where I had a 0 because I set the derivative equal to 0. To the left of 2, eh, put a 0. To the right of 2, eh, put a 4. And where do I plug them into? The second derivative. I plug it into this right here. So that may take some more thinking than you're used to, but let's see. Uh, e to the 0, let's see, 2 e to the 0 is simply a, a 2 times 0 plus 2 is a 2. That's a 4. Since it's a 4, that means it's positive. If I plug in the, the 4 on the right side, I have 2 e to the 4 times 4 plus 2, a 6. Well, all that I can tell you by looking at it is e to the 4 is always positive, times 2, times 6. It's, it's positive again. So that function was concave up, then it wasn't, and then it is again. Doing something crazy. Okay, so it never changed signs. So it's, I would say, I know you're tempted to say concave everywhere. No, it's not. It's not concave at two. I'm sorry, concave up everywhere. But it's really not because somewhere happens in here where it's not concave up. So all I can say is negative infinity to the two, union two to infinity, concave up because 
f double prime of x was greater than zero. And there was no point of inflection because they never changed signs. Concavity never, never changed signs. Okay. You good to go on that page? Next page. Another one. I want you to practice your quotient rule if you want. I'll do it with a quotient rule. I think for second period or A day, I didn't do quotient rule. I think we wrote, we wrote it as a, a 3 to the x squared minus 3 to the negative 1. And it works out just fine. I don't need quotient rule for that. But uh, let's just do the first. Oh, wait a minute. That is the first derivative. <laughs> I almost was going to do the derivative twice. I only need to go second derivative one time now. So the bottom, x squared minus 3, times the derivative of the top, which is 0, minus the top, 3, times the derivative of the bottom, x squared minus 3, that's 2x. All divided by x squared minus 3 squared. So that simplifies since this part all goes to 0. Simply a negative 6x over x squared minus 3 squared. I'm going to have to set this equal to 0 to find my critical numbers. Now this time, I have a place where the derivative possibly is undefined because of this denominator. So I need to say let negative 6x be equal to 0. And then I also need to say let x squared minus 3 squared be equal to 0. This is where the derivative is defined, the second derivative. This is where the derivative is undefined. So wherever that is happens, so in this case, I get simply x is 0 is one of my critical numbers. And this one here. Once I square root both sides, I get x minus 3 is still equal to 0. x equals to 3. So I have two critical numbers that I will make my sign chart and plug it into the second derivative. And I have the 0 and I have the 3. Both places, the second derivative well, this was 0, and this one is where it was undefined. But it's still fair game. So I need a number to the left of 0, negative 1. A number between 0 and 3, one's pretty easy to deal with. And bigger than 3, I'll go with a 10, just to be silly. And I'm going to use this as my second derivative because it looks so much easier to plug in. So if I plug in a negative 1 in the top, if I plug in a negative 1 to the top, that gives me a 6. If I plug in a negative 1 to the bottom, it really doesn't matter because I am squaring the whole thing. So no matter what happens, it's positive. And 6 over positive is still positive. If I plug in a 1 at the top, then I get negative 6 times negative 6 over a positive. Regardless, that stays negative. And if I plug in a 10 on the top, if I plug in a 10 on the top, I get a negative 60 on top, and the bottom will always be positive. So that'll be negative. That's if I did this right, and if I didn't do something right. Oh, well, you'll have to tell me about it. Yeah, I think it's right. So the function looks something like this. It was concave up, then it was concave down, and then it's concave down again. Something is happening because right here, the concavity changed. So there is a point of inflection here somewhere. 
but let's talk about the concavity. From negative infinity to zero was concave up because f prime of x was greater than zero. From zero to three union three to infinity both of those were concave down. Because f double prime of x was less than zero. And there is a point of inflection at x equals to zero. Because concavity changed uh, from from up to down. Concave up to concave down. Now, we often think that the second derivative is used for concavity and only concavity, and most of us tend to still follow that when we're looking for concavity and points of inflection. But we could also use it to find extremis. We call that the second derivative test. And it's another way to find max and mins. Uh, what we do is, I can't remember if the author wanted us to write a paragraph or it's, it's just a second derivative test. It's, what we do is st step one, we find critical numbers numbers of the first derivative. We, step two, find the second derivative. Step three, oh, let me do something. Those critical numbers, I'll call it, uh, like x equals to a or b or however many there are, whatever. And then we find the second derivative. Then what I want you to do is I want you to take that second derivative. I'll just call it uh, g double prime at a, g double prime at b, whatever there is. So I'm substituting the original critical numbers into second derivative. And what happens is, think about something. If you plug in any number into your second derivative and you get positive, then we know it was concave up. If you plug any number in and get negative, well, we know it was concave down. So if it was concave up and you plugged in a critical number from your first derivative, you just found a relative min. If your concavity is positive and you plug in the critical number, then it was a minimum because it was concave up. So you had to have a relative minimum. If you plug in your b into your second derivative and had g double prime of b and it was uh, less than zero, that means your function was concave down. Meaning at b had to be a relative max. Kind of cool, actually. And it's too bad most of us don't use that enough. We're just so happy making sign charts of the first derivative 
And that's fine. If you love making sign charts, you, you can do it. But if you can do the second derivative and plug into it, it might be actually easier. So let's try a couple here. Use the second derivative to locate and classify all x values, just the x values. I don't need the whole order pair of relative extrema. So if I'm doing the first one, I first do my f prime of x, 4x cubed, minus 12x squared, set that equal to 0, and I find out that uh, I could factor out a uh, 2x squared. Yeah, I can factor out 2x squared, leaving uh, 2x. And that was a plus, wasn't it? A plus. Oh, wait, that was a minus. What am I thinking? It was a minus 12x, so... It was a 2x. Oh, I could have factored out more then, because that was a 12x. Why don't I factor out the 4? Four? 4x four squared. That doesn't, that leaves just a, let me erase that. That left uh, just an x minus a 3. Yeah, I think so, is 0. So x equals to 0, x equals to 3 are your critical numbers of your first derivative. So I'm going to go and take this and go ahead and finish up my second derivative. And I get uh, 12x squared minus 24x. So now I evaluate f double prime at 0. And I evaluate f double prime at 3. f double prime at 0 is 0. That tells me nothing about the uh, concavity. It means it's uh, the, the second derivative is not 0. I mean, that's not telling me anything. I needed to see positive or negative. So, tells me nothing. <laughs> and, if, and if I plug in f double prime of 3, that gives me 12 times 9 minus 24 times 3, 108 minus 72, is that what that is? And that is... Uh, 36, which is positive 36, meaning it was concave up, meaning I found a relative minimum at x equals to 3. Okay. Last one, trig, and f prime of theta would be a negative 2 sine of theta minus 1. Set that equal to 0. I get negative 2 sine of theta is 1. I get sine of theta is a negative 1 half. What quadrants are sine negative? Sine is negative in both of these two quadrants. So I have an angle that could be here. I have an angle that could be here. The question is, what reference angle are these? Well, we know we're dealing with a half. So my, my triangle that would give me a theta and sine of theta being a half would be opposite over hypotenuse. Across the street from the 1 was always the 30-degree angle. Theta has to be 30 degrees. Or, in calculus talk, pi over 6. So since these are both pi over 6s, or 30 degrees, then that would be 30 degrees added to 180. That's 180 plus 30 
that's 210 degrees. But that's also the same as uh, 7 pi over 6. And then this is 30 taken away. That's 1 less pi over 6 from 360. So that would be instead of 12 pi over 6s, that would be 11 pi over 6s. Those are my critical numbers. Take my second derivative. I have double prime of theta. Derivative of sine is cosine. Negative 2 cosine of theta. Derivative of minus 1 is 0. So now i got to take my f double prime of theta. Uh, not f double prime of theta. I've got to take my f double prime of pi over 6. 7 pi over 6. And we know it's going to be negative because it's, it's in this side. So the cosine is going to be negative over there. And then I have to also have to evaluate f double prime of 11 pi over 6, which is going to be cosine is positive over here. So I know this will be positive. This one's going to be negative. So the good news is all I care about is that same triangle. That triangle, 30 degrees, 1, 2, square roots of 3. That has to be the negative 1. So the, co the cosine is adjacent over, I oh, that's negative also. Adjacent over hypotenuse, so that's a negative squared 3 over 2. This one is using the triangle out here. So there's your 30 degree. 1, 2, square root of 3. In this case, this gives you the negative 1. This is positive, And the cosine is going to be a positive square root of 3 over 2. Since this is negative was concave down. Therefore, this must be a relative min. Relative min at 7 pi over 6. Since this was positive, this was concave up, and it's sitting down here, so it must be a relative... Wait, I messed up. It's a, re it's a relative max. I know you were yelling, throwing something at the computer, weren't you? And this is concave up because it was positive. That's a, that is a relative min at 11 pi over 6. Okay, that was just so much fun. It was more fun than a barrel of monkeys. And you know what? If anybody secretly replies to me that this is more fun than a barrel of monkeys... You got extra credit. There's your homework. And it's all, it's not that many. All of them. And uh, so I'm calling it quits. Over and out. That's not okay. that many at all.